and I work with a or nonprofit organization called Tennessee End of Life Partnership, TELP. And if y'all are, Kitty, I can't see anything but my PowerPoint. So you will have to tell me if there's any questions or anything because I can't, I'm afraid to try to minimize because I'm afraid I'll lose it. So anyway. You're fine. You're fine. I will I'll watch it for you. Okay. Um, anyway, let me, just a little bit about myself and my first line of work. I am a registered dental hygienist. I'm a clinical instructor at the University of Tennessee uh, Dental College in Memphis but I have been active in long-term care work for probably um, about 10 or 12 years. My mother was diagnosed at 62 with Alzheimer's. She died at 72. I've had two of her sisters also with Alzheimer's and just several family members that just had chronic illnesses. My dad had congestive heart failure. So I've been involved with that. And about five years ago, I really got active with TELP and helping um, lead some of the life planning facilitator classes across the whole state. Um, TELP is a nonprofit organization. We are statewide. We do things across the whole state of Tennessee. And it started, TELPS began in about 1998 um, when a group of doctors, attorneys, legislative people, just a whole group of healthcare minded people got together because they were concerned about the care people were getting at end of life. So um, Judy Eads, who is now our president, at that time was the assistant commissioner of health for the state of Tennessee. And she helped work with the legislative in writing the Health Care Decision Acts of 2004. Uh, hopefully you are familiar with that because the rules and regs help govern long-term care. But what happened is all, all these rules were passed, but there was no education and there was no money set aside for education. So all these facilities had these new rules, these new forms, but they really weren't sure how to use them. So TEL was concerned about that and they got a grant and got some people trained and started doing some training. And as y'all know, there's a lot of turnover in healthcare. So it's a continuous thing. I mean, we go in, we get areas trained on these forms and then and within six months, there's a whole new group of people. So that's kind of what TELP started out doing. Over the last few years, we've realized that it's better if we can start having these conversations about quality of life before we get to crisis situations. And we'll talk, dig into that a little bit more as we go throughout this presentation. But we're, we started a community group just trying to educate people at younger ages about advanced directives and trying to get people to start having conversations earlier in life because we never know what curveball life is going to throw at us. So trying to get those conversations going earlier so that when we do hit a crisis situation, it's not, we're not in panic mode. We already have got that ball rolling, kind of know what, what our loved ones or ourselves would want. And I would encourage, um, if you need more information about anything we talk about today on our website, there's forms, there's um, some articles. We also, they'll be posted in the next week or so. Hopefully we're gonna have a conference in May that'll be via webinar, but we will be hosting an in live uh, life planning facilitator class, which is our training class. It's a four hour CE class. And that the one in June is going to be at um, Tennessee Healthcare Association in Nashville. Kim, are you still there? You froze up. Okay, everybody, hang on just one second. Let me see if I can get Kim back.
when you've done this yourself so that you can speak from experience because anytime you can use a personal experience to share when you're helping someone do something it helps you connect but I'm going to start out and it's uh, these webinars it's kind of hard because I can't see y'all and I don't really know expressions or what but I'm going to ask some questions that you can kind of think in your head but um who decides what you wear every morning the most of y'all get up you pick out your own clothes. You decide what you want to eat each day. I mean, you're not depending on someone else to make these just small little decisions. So when you think about that and then you think about the fact that the majority of us. Hey, Kim, your slides aren't changing. They're not? No. Oh, gosh. Not now either. Uh-uh. We still see it like in the main PowerPoint view. Okay. Well, let's do this. Um, do you want me to do it? For, I mean, I yeah. Mind. Okay. Yeah, go ahead because it may take me a minute to. Let me get it pulled up and I will. Sorry, everyone. Okay, Let's do you see it? Yes, I do. Go you were to, right there. Yep. Okay. Or if you want to go back one in case someone wants to write down the um, email and website right there. No, right now it's in just like presenters mode. Do you want to put it like? Well, I'm afraid if I put it in the in big mode that it's going to. I won't okay. be able to see anything else. So okay, I'll, just, I'll switch. That, it. That, that works. I mean, I pretty much have done this so many times that I know the slide. So okay, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. And okay, so we were going back to just talking about how we want to make most of the decisions for our life, but what we're finding next slide is that the um. Some of the most important decisions to be made, like medical decisions, people are leaving those up to chance because they're not planning. Because we don't know what's going to happen uh, tomorrow, the next day, whatever. I mean, we don't know what tomorrow brings. So if we haven't started planning ahead, we're basically leaving our healthcare decisions up to um the medical profession or our loved ones having to make decisions and they really don't know what we would want. Next slide. So today we're going to introduce you to the advanced care planning. We're going to guide you through the important process. And I'm going to try to move this. Okay, she's going to get back on in just a second. Sorry, guys. Okay, try again. <clears throat> Let's see, whatever can go wrong will go wrong. Hey, it's um, it's all good. We're we're all still sitting here waiting. You're fine. Okay. So also, um, I wanted to encourage people to share your decisions with family members or loved ones. Conversation, and that is the key thing: is conversation. It doesn't really matter what you decide 
if you haven't let anyone know and talked about it, and you can uh, help your family avoid a lot of stressful um, arguments and situations when you've had conversation. Because if you've got more than one person in your life that's going to be around when you run into crisis situations or get a poor prognosis about a, diagno um, a medical condition, very rarely is everyone in the family on the same page. So if they're having to make those decisions, there's going to be a lot of not so pleasant conversations. And we've found this over and over. And if you've worked in uh, long-term care or in nursing home situations that families can be divided by having to make these decisions when they're not on the same page. Uh, is there any way, Keita, that you can raise that? Uh, like my toolbar is, is right and I tried to move it and that's when it, yeah, there you go. And then we're going to provide you, that's good right there. That's good. Um, provide you with the tools to, to help make sure your wishes are known. You can go to the next slide. Yeah, I was trying to move the toolbar and that's when I totally logged me out. Um, okay, a century ago, in the early 1900s, the life expectancy was only about 49 years. And the reason for this were healthcare was just focused on comfort. And we really didn't have all the technology that we have today. Plus people, the, the type of work people did then, there were a lot of accidents and believe it or not, just you know, out on the frontier, the wild animals. So there was a lot going on, but you also had people living in households where there were whole family units in a household. So people were more accustomed to death and seeing death. So it wasn't such a taboo subject then. Fast forward into today's time, people are living longer. In 2017, the average age was about 89. That's dropped down to about 74 now. And a lot of it is attributed to the opioid issues that are going on. But only about 10% of people today die suddenly, like a massive heart attack or an accident or something like that. The majority of us are living with chronic illnesses for long periods of time. I mean, if, if we could take a poll right now, there probably would be very few people that aren't on some type of medication, either for cholesterol, high blood pressure, you know, whatever it is, but we're all living with some type of chronic illness. And technology has changed to where basically science can keep us alive indefinitely. So that's kind of the where we've evolved from. So now, Americans don't really discuss death. It's like not something they think about planning for. It's so it's put us in a very difficult situation when it comes to end of life decisions. Next slide. So what we've found about 50% of people won't be able to make their own decisions when it comes time at, at when they're in an end of life situation. Um, be it from dementia or an accident, you know, traumatic brain injury, whatever the reason is, there's a large majority of people that will be at a time when medical decisions need to be made and they will not be able to make those decisions. And unfortunately, if the healthcare professionals don't have some blueprint to go by, the default is to treat. They have to treat you to the fullest. They can't do selective treatment or anything like that. It has to be to the fullest. And if you haven't spoken with your doctors or your family or the people that would be there to make those decisions once you are at a hospital situation or whatever, then it's very hard to predict. If your family doesn't know and the doctors come out asking them, what do you want done? Do you want this done or that? They don't know. Actually, um, I'll share a situation that just happened my oldest daughter's, one of her best friends has been taking care of her mother who had early onset Alzheimer's that started when she was um, in her 50s, uh, early 50s. And she has been living with her daughter and her husband ever since a year after 
well, actually before they even got married. And she has declined and declined. And now it's to the point where the doctors were asking about a feeding tube. And she and her brother were having to make this decision. And luckily, the patient had a living will. And she had marked no, that she did not want any of this. And I just had a talk with my daughter yesterday because um, this person and her brother had to pray and cry for a couple of days because they weren't 100% sure that the mother knew exactly what she was doing when she filled it out, but they had to go with the fact that she did, she was, um, she did have capacity enough to understand when she was filling this out. So it did give them a blueprint, even though it was hard to make this decision it made it a little bit easier knowing that that's what their mother would have wanted. So I just wanted to share a little personal experience that's happening now, because most of us, when we're in our fifties, think we still have a long time to go and we're thinking, okay, we'll do that. We'll make those plans later. Next slide. Um, and this is just another example. I don't, some of you may be too young to remember these three incidents, but when we think about planning for end of life or long-term care, we always think about the elderly. But uh, those of you that work in rehab know that you have 30 year olds that have had strokes that are in rehab, but these are three prime examples of people that had not made plans for long-term care, wouldn't even thinking about it, just young, vibrant women and life happened and like Terry Shravo was on um, in a vegetative state for over 15 years while her parents and her husband battled it out in the courts about whether to take her off life support or not. So these are just a few examples that I wanted to share with you about things that can happen when we haven't planned for care and it happens at any age. Next slide. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the importance of life planning. And that's what we call this. Instead of planning for end of life, we're planning for life, to live the best life we can until we no longer are breathing or no longer have a pulse. And by making these plans ahead of time, it provides communication and instructions of patients' preferences for end of life treatment across the care settings means you can move this, it, it goes from with you wherever you go, like hospitals to your doctors, wherever. It defines the patient's quality of life because what is quality to me may not be quality to someone else. So by making plans ahead of time, you can define what quality is for yourself. And the biggest thing is no one has to guess what type treatment the patient wants or does not want. And I'm saying patient, but I'm also talking, as I said earlier, I do encourage if you do not have an advanced directive or any type of um, advanced care plan, I do encourage you to go ahead and do this because it's, it's never too early. I think that was one of the questions in the um, quiz that we did or the questionnaire we answered before this is you, it's never too early to start planning. Okay, next slide. Um, this is just a few more statistics. Is 80% of people say that they would want to make plans or talk to their doctor about end of life decisions, but only 7% um, actually have. Um, only about 25, only when doctors were asked only about 7% actually knew that um, their patients even had advanced directives. So there is a big disconnect with, and a lot of patients say that they want their doctor to ask them about advanced care planning. And if you talk to doctors, they're waiting on the patient to ask. So there's a disconnect in there. A lot of doctors don't feel comfortable. I know when, you, when you're in a facility, you, generally it's the director of nurses or the social workers. A lot of times it's the social workers that are handling all of this. So when you're out in 
not in a long-term care facility and you're just someone going to the doctor, it's rare that a doctor is going to bring up. Um, and when you check in, they always ask you if you have an advanced directive and if not, do you want information about one? But usually all they have is a pamphlet and there's no one to really talk to you about it. So there's a, there's a big disconnect there. Okay, next slide. All right, can you blow this up just a little bit or make it a little bit bigger? That's good, yeah, that's good. Okay, these are just a few more facts that I'm gonna share with you. 60% um, of the people in surveys say that they would like to keep the, their family from having burdens at the end of life, but uh, only 50, 6% have actually talked to anyone about their family or anyone about end of life care. 70% of people prefer to die at home, but yet 70% of people die in nursing home or long-term care facilities. Some of that can't be helped. Um, we luckily were able to keep my mom at home. She lived in the country. You could get care a lot cheaper, a lot less expensive there. Um, we had great hospice nurses coming in, but a lot of times families are not able to do that. So that choice is not always up to the person, but there are many times that arrangements could be made if plan, if they had planned ahead of time. And then back to the 80% would like to talk to their doctors, but 93% um, never having connected talked a conversation about what they would want. So, and it's always important to put your wishes in writing, but actually only about 23% of the population has done that. So even though people are starting to feel that it's important, they're still not making the efforts to get this, get it done and get the paperwork filled out and the conversation started with their families. Next slide. Okay, this is one of my favorite slides when we're talking about starting conversation early. In the United States, at age 18, you can legally sign your advanced direct, complete an advanced directive and sign it. But there's got to be more than just filling out the form. And if you look down the side, the word conversation is there because what we want in our teens is not the life goals that we would have as we get older. So it's very important once you complete your advanced directive form, you talk to your family, you get it, you know, if this were to happen to me today, this would be what I would want. But if a person gets married and starts having children, their goals in life and their quality for life and what they would want would probably change. Um, and then if you come to a time where you're diagnosed with a serious or um, terminal disease, then you would want to review these forms again and have more discussion. And then we'll talk a little bit at the end about the post form, but there could be a time when that would be appropriate for, for a person. But the biggest thing to concentrate on here is the word conversation, is talking with our families. And we'll learn a little bit more about how to get this started as we progress through this presentation. Next slide. All right, why don't we plan ahead? You know, we've just seen that people aren't actually doing it. So what are some reasons that people don't do that? Well, as I said earlier, in the United States, we just avoid talking about any type of death. We kind of like if you sweep it under the rug, it doesn't happen. A lot of people think it's too early that this is for the elderly or the frail or sick. And then other people think you have to have an attorney to do advanced directives, and that is a myth also. Um, it is advisable to have an attorney for financial um, planning, but for health care, you do not need an attorney. Um, they can do a living will for you, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, but you do not have to have an attorney to do advanced directives. And then the other thing is, you know, we talked about dying suddenly. That's this first, the first um, slide here. 
if you die suddenly, there's really not a need for any life planning. I mean, you go out, you are in a car wreck and you don't make it out and there's no reason for life planning, but that's not how most of us die. Take cancer, for instance. When someone's diagnosed with cancer, generally for a long period of time, sometimes it's years, they're doing well. They go through chemo, um, they come out, they're fine. They may, you know, have a relapse, but generally with the doctors, never during this time are they starting conversations about what if this were, what if this chemo doesn't work? And what we're finding is that they're waiting until there are no other options, nothing is working and the patient is, is spiraling down and then they start having conversations with the family and with the patient. Well, at that point, it's very stressful. The um, patient is not in a good state of mind. The family is not in a good state of mind. So it's really hard to make uh, rash decisions and to really know what that patient would want when we're in this situation. And then we go over to dementia, the same thing. Most people that are patients that are diagnosed with Alzheimer's or any type of dementia, when they start out, they are still capable of making their own decisions. If you ask them these questions about what is quality to them and what they would want long-term, at the very early stages, they can make those decisions. But what we're finding is those questions are never asked. And then you get down to where you're having to make a decision about a feeding tube or um, any of the situations that have to be talked about. And by the point that you, they start talking about it, the patient has no, no longer has capacity to make those decisions and it falls back on the family. And the family is having like the situation I just shared with you, trying to make these decisions and not having a roadmap or a guideline to go by. And the same thing with organ failure. It's just the healthcare facilities are waiting until we're at the crisis situation before they bring up advanced care planning or start trying to make decisions for what they would want at this point in time instead of giving the family and the patient time to talk about it. With congestive heart failure or COPD, you would be surprised at how many people that are diagnosed with these um, two illnesses that don't really understand that they're going to die from this. Um, they just think it's like high blood pressure that, you know, you can just live with it forever as long as you take your medication. They don't realize what the, the long-term roadmap looks like when you, when you are diagnosed with this. So it's very important to start talking about this early when you have patients or residents that have been diagnosed. I think um, Keita said there's a lot of caregivers on here. If you're caregiving for somebody that still has capacity, but they have an illness that is going to progress down the road like this, then trying to initiate these conversations. And we'll talk about how to do that in a little bit. But I mean, it's never too early. Next slide. And then we had COVID. When we talk about not being too early, um, tell, Judy Eads, our president, had so many phone calls during the, all this time of COVID because people were caught without any healthcare directives and loved ones were in hospitals on ventilators. And these are not all old people. There were a lot of young people and there was no guideline, no um, no plans for this because, I mean, we really didn't see this coming. And, but we never know when this, when any other pandemic like this is going to hit us. So uh, being hit with COVID has really opened a lot of people's eyes to needing to have made plans for um, quality of life and what you would want in the medical field. Okay, next. Okay, there's three major things we're going to talk uh, touch on today, and one is advanced care plans. Uh, several years ago, the actual form was called an advanced care plan. Today, that is not the case because it's more than just the form. Advanced care plan is the whole conversation, the whole from start to finish, from 
deciding what you want to talking with your family. It's the whole game. It's the plan, putting it together. The advanced directive is the actual form that you would complete to make sure that your healthcare wishes are known. And then a post form is a form that is completed only by a physician. And a post is for people that are seriously ill and frail. And this is in our life planning facilitator classes. This is the part that gets kind of confusing. Um, the advanced directive is not used very much. We'll have facilities that we find that as soon as a patient comes in, they're trying to fill out a post form for them. Well, not everyone is post appropriate. So the advanced directive is the form to start with. And we're going to um, dive into the parts of this and the how it's used and the correct usage for this form in just a little bit. Okay, next. The many times these forms, living will, advanced care planning and advanced directive, like I said earlier, the advanced care planning is the whole process. And a living will and advanced directive do similar things. A living will is something that's um, created by an attorney. It's many pages and advanced directive. Um, the state has a model form. You can use that. There's five wishes. There's several forms, but there's, you don't have to have an attorney to fill out the living will. You can use just an advanced directive form. And we're trying to get people like, Usually when you hear living will, you think of dying, but we're trying to change that to where we're focusing more on life planning and quality of life, living the best life that you can until you're no longer breathing. So that's why we're talking about advanced care planning instead of end of life planning. We're trying to plan for the best life possible. Next slide. Okay that when you're doing an advanced care plan, it can help you design treatment strategies as you move through life. As I talked about earlier, your goals when you're 18 are gonna be different than your goals when you're 30, 40. So it's not a one-stop shop. You fill out a form, you, you file it away and you're done. This is something that needs to be thought about at each step of the way. Like, you know, if I'm in my, 20s and no family or anything and I have a traumatic brain injury my goals for treatment might be different than if I'm in my 70s um, if I'm going through cancer treatment and there's no other treatments available but I've got a daughter that's getting married in a few months I might want to do everything I can to be able to make it to her wedding where otherwise I might just want comfort measures. So at each stage of life, your goals may be different. Next slide. When we do plan ahead, it gives you <clears throat> and your family a peace of mind. They know what your wishes are. You know that they know. So there's not going to be, well, I'm not going to say there's not going to be any because there's, if you've got several people, there's always some conflict, but it cuts down on the conflict when this crisis does happen and there's decisions that have to be made. It prevents questions and confusion and disagreement, and it provides important information to your healthcare team when they have everything on file and they use it properly and it's where it needs to be because we oftentimes find that there's forms that have been filled out, but um, some facilities don't put them where they're readily available, but that's a whole different thing. But so anyway, so just planning ahead just helps cut down on the stress. Next slide. There is a process for this advanced care planning. It's not just, um, get a piece of paper and check off the boxes. You really need to consider your wishes for care, what's important to you, what your goals are. One of the most important parts is to select your agent or your decision maker. This is someone that will make decisions for you if there comes a time that you can't. That is, even if you don't do the rest of the form, I just highly recommend that you at least get that part of the form 
completed. And I said, as we've said, conversation, conversation, discuss your wishes with your agent, also with anyone else that would be involved with your health care and your doctor. Complete the advanced directive document and then give copies to everyone that's involved with your health care. Next slide. Um, keep going. All right. This is just a little food for thought here. How many of you have already done this? And if you have, if you've got a living will or an advanced directive, think about where it is stored. Is it in a safe place locked away? And who knows where this is? Because so many people get a living will, they put it in their lockbox, and their spouse is about the only one that knows where that is. It's not doing you any good if that's the situation. These documents should not be sacred documents for healthcare. You need to share the, the document I and mean, copies are legal. So anybody that might have anything to do with your healthcare, you need to share those documents with them. And again, when was the last time you updated these documents? Um, if it's been five or 10 years, you may want to re go revisit and just read over it and make sure that, that what you put on there is what you still would want for your health care. Next slide. Okay, this I just kind of threw in. It's very interesting. It really doesn't have anything to do with advanced care planning. It's just um, the United States spends more on health care than pretty much any other country, but yet we're not living longer. If you see that life expectancy is going up the top and the money spent is the grid across the bottom. So I just find this fascinating. And I don't know if it's because our health care just is more expensive over here. It's why our cost is more, but there's a lot of countries that are living healthier lives than we are, but spending a whole lot less on health care. So I just kind of threw that in interesting fact in the midst of all this planning here. Next slide. Okay, now we're going to get into some of the steps of <clears throat> actually getting your thoughts in order and things that you need to think about when you're making your plans to complete your advanced directive. Yeah. You want to think about things to consider while organizing is my loved ones, you, whether they know exactly what you want. Are you worried that you'll receive not enough care or too much care or you just want to be made comfortable? These are just some of the, the bullet points to kind of think about before you start trying to fill out um, advanced care direct planning. Next slide. Also, your medical condition. Some people want to know everything about their medical condition. Some just want to know the basics. So, um, and with the internet today, you can look up so much, but not everything is accurate. So you have to be careful with that, but just figure out what's important to you so that you can have a road roadmap. Next slide, please. And then the treatment. Do you want your doctor to make all the decisions? Do you trust that they'll make what's best for you? Or do you want to have some say so? Or do you want to be totally in control? And maybe there's pros and cons to everything. I will tell you that generally a doctor's goal is to keep you alive. It all, most doctors do not do not want somebody dying on their watch and they're going to offer you all the treatments. Um, but it's like if you've got a, a 1975 car you're driving and it's on its last leg and the mechanic's going to give you everything that needs to be done to that car but you have to kind of make the decision is it is it worth it at that point what is the quality over quantity um, that's something we had a, a resident in one of our homes that was diabetic and kept finding Twinkie wrappers I mean all the time getting the lecture, you know, you're diabetic, you can't be sneaking Twinkies. And then finally, one of the nurses went in to talk to him and he just basically said, you know, 
you can say whatever you want to, but I'm 91 years old and I'm choosing quality over quantity. If I die eating Twinkies, I've died a happy man. So you have to figure out, you know, what treatments are, are best for you or what is quality or quantity for you. So next slide, please. And these are just some of the um, tasks in life. How important are each of the following to your ideal quality of life? I'm not going to read all of these to y'all. Y'all can read, but figure out at what point quality and quantity kind of swap places. I mean, if you're younger and there's a few of these things that you can't do, but as you lose your capacity to do things like First, you can't really um, walk without a walker. And or then it progresses to where you're having problems feeding yourself. Like at what point does the quality get to be so poor that it's not worth the quantity? And you read through these and figure out what are, what are important to you to be able to do to justify having quality of life. Next slide. And then what gives your life meaning? What things do you worry about? What makes you happy? And there are there things to, that scare you? And just write these things down and it's kind of like an outline that you're gonna use or help someone. I'm, I'm talking to each of you, but if you're caregivers and you're helping someone else do this, then these are just questions to ask them to help put together a blueprint to help them complete an advanced directive. Next slide. Um, if you are helping a loved one or uh, someone that you're caring for make this plan, advanced care plan, always remember that it's a journey. It's not a sprint. We don't have to sit down and get all the answers right off. You can plant seeds and just talk a little bit, bring up different experiences. Um, asking them about other family members and just bringing in other things to help them get a vision of where they want to go. Uh, not everyone will agree with the decisions that you or a loved one makes, but by planning in advance that gives you time to talk through this. Like I've, I made a decision that I didn't want tube feeding and my children didn't understand why, it gives us time to talk through that and help hopefully help bring them around to where they would honor the decision. So next slide. And we've talked a little, little bit about this, ways to raise the issue. If you're trying to get a family member and a lot of people come to me, it's like my parents need to make advanced directives, their health is failing, but um, they really don't wanna talk about it. So instead of just totally bringing out Let's make plans for um, when you can't make decisions for yourself. Bring up little subjects. Talk about um, illness or death of relatives and use that as an intro. Like, you know, Uncle John just died of this and this is what they his family did for him. Would that be something you would want? You know, that wouldn't be anything I would want and just you can use examples like that or an article. Well, we used to have a lot of newspapers, not many people read newspapers now, but if you read something, you know, print it off and say, hey, I read this and it was very interesting. There's just ways to introduce and pull out information without setting them down and just saying, we need to fill out these advanced directives because many times families think you're trying to kill them off or you're trying to take all their money. Um, they're not open to, to making plans because they they think that you're gonna have the doctors pull the plug on them if they get sick so instead of just diving straight in you know take baby steps and just slowly bring the conversation around and draw out some of the things that are important to them next slide okay the advanced care plan is a way to make health care wishes known if you're unable to communicate, this is your blueprint when you become unable to communicate and it allows persons to either or both of the following, appoint a healthcare agent, which I said earlier is the most important part. And, um, and I think 
The next thing is uh, make known your decisions for your, your health care. Next slide. Okay, we talked about this a little bit before, which document, which advanced directive form do you use? Tennessee has a model form. It is on the Tennessee.gov website. I will tell you it's hard to find. Um, you can navigate through and get to it, but it's not that easy to find. But if you go to TELP's website, uh, all of the forms the, that you would use for advanced care plan, the advanced directive post surrogate form, all of those are there. There's pages with questions and answers, instructions on how to complete these forms. So it's all on our websites. So it's easy to get to, but you do not have to use ours. You can pay an attorney to do a living will. Um, but there's also several other, you can get five wishes. A lot of facilities will have their own. There's no one advanced directive that's correct. It's just as long as you have the information that you need on there, and then it must be signed and it must either be witnessed by two people or notarized. And we'll get a little more into that in a little bit about what makes this a legal form. Okay, next slide. Um, I think we've covered this. The living will is actually a lot of pages and some kind of times can be very confusing. Um, it's not as specific depending on the attorney that did it and if they, because a lot of, most attorneys that deal, do living wills, generally they're more fun, like dealing with financial. Um, so their knowledge of what to put into the living will is basically filling in a blueprint so it doesn't get in depth with the information, the state model form or five wishes or some of those forms. Also, the living will has power of attorney and there's two different types of power of attorney. One is for health care and one is financial. And I can't tell you how many times facilities have gotten into uh, taking information and having a, a child or a family member making this healthcare decisions for, for a patient to figure out later that they had health, uh, financial power of attorney, not health care. That's the reason today we're trying to get away from the POA or power of attorney and use the word agent for health care. It's agent for finance. It's power of attorney. Um, but living wills are still are legal and if that's what you have you don't have to go change it just i do advise you to read through it and update it periodically okay next slide okay this slide right here is one of the most important things when you are creating your advanced directive is who do you choose as your agent an agent has to be someone that will stand up for what you want, that's familiar with your goals and is willing, they have to be willing to serve or make decisions for you. But um, it doesn't have to be a family member. It can be anyone that you feel has your best interest at heart and is willing to go to bat for you. Um, we have some people that say, don't choose a weenie for your healthcare agent. There are times that difficult decisions have to be made. There are times they have to stand up against other family members because people do not agree. People that have been in long-term, those of you that have been in long-term care for a long time know that there's just so much, so many times that family members are not on the same page. So you have to have someone that is willing to carry out your decisions and stand up for what you want. Um, you do, it is advisable to tell your other family members, like if you choose one of your children and you've got five children, it's always better if the other children know that who you choose chosen as your agent and why you chose that person. That way it pulls out some of the conflict when the time comes that they have to execute that right. And there is a place on the form to select an alternate. I highly recommend that you do this also, especially if you have elderly people and you're helping them fill out these forms. They, 
most often want to put their spouse down. Well, if their spouse is in poor health also, he may or she may pass away before you even need this document. So then you have no one. So if you have an alternate there, then that helps alleviate if, if the other um, agent is not in capacity when you need to activate these forms. Next slide. What kind of instructions do you put on there? I mean, you can put anything. You can attach amendments to this. You can place of death, um, your doctor preferences, um, accepting or refusing life-sustaining treatment, what quality of life conditions, if you want to be an organ donor. Um, you know, with my parents, my dad had a whole sheet filled out with not only his health care needs, but what songs he wanted at the funeral, who he wanted, Paul Bar Barrows, the preacher, everything on there. So there's space that you can write in a whole lot of more information. Next slide. All right. Uh, back to what makes this document legal. It has to have your signature or date. The person that this form is for has to sign and date the form. The other part is either or. It can be both of them, but it does not have to be. The signature of two witnesses, and one of those witnesses cannot be someone that would stand to gain something from this person's death. It has to be just innocent, you know, person that's not involved with the, that person. And when someone is witnessing a form, they do not have to read it. They do not have to agree with it. They do, all they are doing is saying that I am witnessing that Susie signed this form or whoever, you know, they're just witnessing that person's signature. Or you can have the form notarized. You can do both, like I said, but it doesn't have to be just one or the other. Next slide. Okay. Um, this is just a copy of the Tennessee model form, and I just want to briefly go through um, the sections of this and kind of talk to you a little bit because this is a form, like I said, that a lot of facilities just totally bypass, but it is so important if you're working in a facility or for anyone at least to have someone named to speak for you if something were to happen. Even if you haven't completed the rest of the form yet, any part of the form that's not completed, um, then it the, the law on it is that you would receive full treatment for that. It, but that the top part of this is where you would name your agent and your where the first era is. The second part, the second era is for your health care. And this is where you decide what is quality of life. There's several different conditions here. And if you were to be diagnosed or have one of these conditions where you were permanently in this state, would you consider that to be quality of life or not quality of life? And then if you go down to the below the next line, it's the treatment. This can get a little bit confusing here, and I'm not going to read through the whole the slide with you, but you can print this off. And if you have questions, again, like I said, email me, call me. I'll be happy to help you. But the health care treatment underneath that, like CPR, that correlates with the, the conditions above that you are not willing to live with. That does not mean if you're a healthy person and you're allergic to bees and you go out and you get stung by a bee and go into anaphylactic shock and you've marked no CPR on your advanced directive, that does not mean they're not going to do CPR on you to bring you back. That's a whole different condition. It's only if you were ever diagnosed or um sick with one of the conditions above. And that's the way it is for each part of the treatment on the bottom of that form. It all correlates back up to those conditions above there. So that can be confusing for some people. And a lot of times they're afraid to mark no CPR. Another thing, and you'd be surprised at how many people when you talk to them don't really even though they know it, it doesn't sink in that 
we do not do CPR on a person that is alive. If you have a pulse and you're breathing, you do not need CPR. Um, it's kind of mind boggling that the community out there this doesn't really realize that you have passed away. You are dead before you get CPR. But like I said, if you're just, I mean, even if you have a heart attack and you're still to where you would come back and be functional, they're going to do CPR. Now, if you had a major heart attack and they did CPR and you get back, but from that heart attack, you have some of the conditions up above, then that's when this would go into play. So that's kind of how this works. So I know this is probably very confusing, but hopefully not too bad. Next slide, please. And this is the back of the form. The top is where you can write in your special instructions. Um, if you need to do an attachment, just see, see attachment. You can decide if you want to be an organ donor or any of that. That's where you would mark this on here. And then where the blue line is, you have to sign and date it. And then underneath there is where you would either have the two witnesses or get it notarized. So that is basically the Tennessee model form for advanced directive. Next form, please. Next slide. So what do you do with the document now? Copies are legal. You want to make sure your agent has one. You want to give all of my children. I have uh, five girls, so all of them have copies of my advanced directive. And then anytime you go for a doctor's visit, they always ask about that. So you want to make sure you take them with them so that they can have that in your file if there is ever any question. Or anyone else that would be involved in your healthcare decision should have a copy of your advanced directive. Um, next slide. Uh, keep going. These are supposed to be hidden slides because keep going, keep going, keep going. Okay, I'm going to touch briefly on the post form. This is the form I think most of y'all are more familiar with if you're working in long term care. Um, the three, the four ladies there are all sisters. The one sitting in the chair was my mom. Uh, the only one still alive is the one in the white. The other two ladies have passed away and all three of them had dementia at the end of life. My mom lived the longest. As I said, she was sick for 10 years. But anyway, a physician's order for scope of treatment. Next slide. It is a medical order. It's recognized throughout all the medical systems. A post form is only for someone that is seriously ill, medically frail, someone that you would not be surprised if they passed away in the next year. So that's the reason I'm throwing this in is, like I said earlier, so many facilities try to create a post form for residents coming in, especially when you have a rehab facility, you may have some somebody in their 50s that's just coming in for rehab on their knee, they are not post appropriate. So we don't wanna create a post form on someone that is not post appropriate. But if they are post appropriate, this is a very important document because it is a medical order. It's just like a doctor writing a medication order or whatever, it is a legal document. It's portable, it goes, it's the only, form that can transfer from one facility to another, from the hospital to a nursing home without having to be re, um, recreated. It does need to be reviewed. Um, our form for Tennessee is standardized. We are actually part of the post paradigm. There are about 27 states right now. We're working on trying to get this to where all states have a standardized form so it's easily to be accepted when a patient travels from a state to a state um, without having to do another post form for that state. Um, and this form allows individuals to choose the medical treatments they want to receive and those that they do not want to receive. Uh, it is completed and has to be signed by a physician and um, 
the agent can fill this out if the patient has lost capacity. That's why it's so important to choose an agent that really knows what you want and will stand up for you because this is when it gets very important because when a post comes into play, you are at nearing the end of life. So you want those decisions to be made based on the quality of what you've cho chosen as what's quality for you. Next slide, please. Um, we've already covered this. It's for medically frail. And um, next, next slide. Yeah, it's very important to talk about, as we've said, conversation, to talk about your wishes before you become seriously ill. Do not wait. I just stress this so much until um, don't think that you've still got tomorrow. Just start these conversations early in life. And the focus is on the conversation with your family, your healthcare agent, and your doctor. Okay, next slide. This is just the differences between a post and advanced directive. Um, the post is for the seriously ill. Advanced directive is for all adults that are 18 years or older. Um, time frame is the critically is for the post form is for the critically ill and the advanced directive is our, we call it the what if form. What if this were to happen to you? What if you were to have a traumatic brain injury or what if you were to be diagnosed with this? Um, who completes it? A healthcare professional or a doctor has to complete the post form. The advanced directive is completed by the patient. Um, the post is a medical order and the advanced directive is just that it's an, a directive of how you would want to be treated, but it is not a medical order. Um, and y'all can read through those there. Um, they're both legal documents, but the post form, like I said, is a medical order and the advanced directive is just more of what your wishes are and it helps your care team or your doctors know what your wishes are. And if you were in, um, un, not capable of making your wishes at the end of life, it would guide them in completing your post form. Next, next slide. Where do you keep the post form? If you are a facility, you would want to keep it, most places keep it in the front of the chart. If you're electronic, it would be in there, but um, you would want to keep it where it's easily available, not buried in the, into the file somewhere. If you're at home and you are seriously ill, you would want to keep it um, like my parents had it on the side of the refrigerator or um, some people have a, like a hospice notebook and it's right in the front of that. You just want it to be easy, easily available for if EMT, if the medical services were called or something, a crisis happened where somebody could get to it easily. Next slide. And that is it. Um, sorry for all the technical difficulties and I hope I haven't bored you too much. It's so hard to do this on webinar. I, lo I love seeing people's faces, but you don't get to do that on a webinar. But like I said, if you have any other information, um, endoflifecaretn.org is our website and uh, my email is just kim at endoflifetn.org and I'll be happy to answer any questions for you. Uh, thank you so much Kim for um, doing this for us. It was great information um, and I've had some requests for the PowerPoint and if you're okay with it, I'll send it out to everybody once, yes. once we're all finished up. So um, does anybody have any questions for Kim before she before we're done here? Feel free to you can put it in the chat box. I'm watching the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask it out loud. <clears throat> I do have a question. Um, I used to work in a skilled nursing facility. I was actually the admissions director. So I asked families all the time if they had um, living wills or advanced directives. Um, with the post, even if they have an advanced directive, there still has to be a post completed. Let's say if they go, no, it does not. No. Okay. A post is not required. And if you, 
If you're in a facility now, this is where a lot of facilities get themselves in trouble. If they are a nursing home, especially assisted living, don't so much have this in their policy. But a lot of your um, skilled facilities, uh, nursing homes will have in their policy that every resident has to have a post. But that's not true. But if you have it in your policy and you get surveyed, then you better have one because you're going to get in trouble if you're not. But not everyone has to have a post form. If they want full treatment, CPR, everything, they're going to get that whether they have a form or not. If a patient is a DNR, then you have to have a post form for them. Does that make sense? Yes. And um, I knew that that was always the case because, you know, family would be like, well, they're DNR. And I'm like, then I have to have, you know, either you have to have a advanced post directive or something like that. Otherwise they'll get full treatment. Yes. And, um, and even the advanced directive, if, if the patient is frail, you know, especially in nursing homes, most of those people, you would not be surprised if they passed away in the next year then the advanced directive is a blueprint. It's still good. But in that case, if they're a DNR, you do, do need to get the post completed. Okay. Good question. Does anybody else have any questions? <laughs> I guess you did a great job, Kim. <laughs> I just bored them to sleep. They're all gone. No, you, you just did such a good job explaining it. Everybody's good to go. So, well, I appreciate um, it. And thanks so for having me. Yeah, you're very welcome. Um, for those that are in attendance, um, the pre and post evaluation link is in the uh, chat box. Please go in and complete the post or post evaluation. Um, again, this is for our grant. It's a requirement on our grant and we're just thankful to have it. Um, everybody's in the chat telling you, thank you, Kim, great information. So um, um, I have really a question for you. Does this, for those that need CPR, I mean CPR, gosh, my mind somewhere else. <laughs> Continuing education, do y'all do certificates or anything yes. for the people that registered? Yes, we do a certificate of completion um, in the training. So anybody that needs that, we're happy to send that on to them. Um, so yeah, so Michelle said she wants to see you. So Michelle, I'll get that to you. Um, and if anybody else needs it, just let me know. And, um, but yeah, thank you for doing this. We will have a fourth webinar. I do not have it planned just yet. Um, and uh, that way we can, well, I'll make sure all of you get information on when that has ready to go. Um, but this is for our dementia grant. So we're thankful that you were here to provide that information and, um, I guess if everybody's good, then we're good to go. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.